So folks, we're gonna cover what happens in your ear today. You might recall from our previous lesson that there are two types of mechanoreceptors that I want you to be aware of. The ones that are involved with hearing and the ones that are involved with balance. So we're gonna start off just with how hearing works. So this is a, an overview of hearing. Hearing happens when sound vibrates and moves the particles around the sound source. So right now, I'm the sound source and particles are vibrating and moving around me where the sound is coming out. Now your hearing system is detecting these movements because there's little fluctuations in atmospheric pressure called sound waves. So the sound is coming in a wave from me to you. And you have in your inner ear mechanoreceptors. So those are the ones that detect movement and physical stimuli like that. So these mechanical or mechanoreceptors in your inner ear convert sound waves into electrochemical energy. So it's not a nerve impulse yet, but it's going to be. Just like the photoreceptors in your eye take light and convert that into a nerve impulse, mechanoreceptors in your ear will take the movement particles because of sound, convert that into electrochemical energy, so our nerve impulse action potentials, and then your brain will eventually perceive it as sound. Now for those of you uh, who took one, you'll recall that uh, I passed out a little handout that just had pictures on it in case you didn't have the notes printed. And on that are some pictures uh, that go with your ear. So if you have that sheet, you might wanna have that out or if you have the notes, you have the pictures in it already. Now before I go to the next slide, which starts off with the pictures, does anyone need to ask anything here? ear. We'll start with the outer ear, which is over here on the left side of the picture. If you think of an ear, you're thinking of the pinna. The pinna is the visible part of the ear. It's made out of skin and cartilage. It helps channel vibrations from sound towards the inner part of your ear. So it's like it's the collector. It's helping funnel all of that sound particle movement towards the other parts of your ear. Followed next by the auditory or ear canal. So that's the tube down which you shouldn't, but maybe have stuck a Q-tip, right? Uh, doctor would tell you never stick stuff in your ear, uh, but sometimes it's hard to resist trying to get things out that way. But this auditory or ear canal is the tube that leads towards your eardrum. Now there are some bits of hair and wax in this part of your ear, and they're not just there to irritate you. They have a function. They are supposed to prevent stuff like dust, perhaps even stuff like insects from getting farther into your ear. Now, perhaps you've had the experience at some point of having your ear feel plugged because there's been wax buildup. One of the ways you can get wax built up in your ear uh, is by constantly pushing something into your ear. It happened to me once a couple of years ago. Uh, I had a little headset thing that I used to record my podcast and it had a little earbud piece and I was constantly putting in my right ear this little earbud piece with the microphone until we got these bad boys that just pick up my voice from anywhere. Uh, and it got so bad that I couldn't get the wax out of my ear. I tried one of those wax removal kits. Then I got freaked out and worried that I might be going deaf because it happened to my dad. His auditory nerve got a virus and he lost his hearing. And so then I was freaked out that that was happening. So I went to the doctor and they used their superpower ear flusher syringe thing. And the ball of wax that came out of my ear was like legit the size of a small cherry. It was bigger than a pea, right? So like it was big, it was a huge chunk of wax. I asked her if I could keep it and she looked at me like I was a psycho and then just walked out of the room. 
whatever. I always ask if I can keep stuff when I have medical procedures, and they always say no. Uh, but it's there for a purpose. And so uh, it might seem to you like the wax is there to irritate you, but really it's trying to stop things from getting farther into your ear where things get much more sensitive. So that's the outer ear, pinna and auditory canal. As we move towards the inside, same picture, right, just different words, we have the middle ear. So the middle ear is this section right here, okay? It's made up mainly of your eardrum. Your eardrum is the colloquialism. See, that's an English language arts word that I remember from high school. Um, this is the common word for this structure. The fancy word is tympanic membrane. So your eardrum, or your tympanic membrane, is this elastic circular membrane that vibrates in response to sound waves. Think about how a drum works. It's an elastic circular membrane stretched out over something and you bang on it and then it vibrates. Uh, and so you can see why it got the name ear drum. Your eardrum is then connected to the next three little pieces here that we collectively refer to as ossicles. They're actually three tiny little bones. They're awesome. Uh, they take the vibrations that are coming from the eardrum and amplify them, increase them in power as they pass. Now, the ossicles have names. One of them is the malleus, which means the hammer. The next one is the incus, which means the anvil, like what uh, y or the roadrunner drops on Wile E. Coyote, an anvil, like a big solid metal thing. And then the last one is the stapes, or the stirrup, like what you'd put your foot in if you were getting up to ride a horse. Now, we'll refer to them as the ossicles, but I'd like for you to know what they are. They have those names because that's kind of the shape that they have. So if you were to look at them closely, the one that's called the malleus kind of looks like a little hammer. The one that's called the incus kind of looks like a little anvil. And the one that's called the stapes, the last piece, kind of looks like a little stirrup. The last one, which is what ladder means, so the stapes, concentrates vibrations on the wall of the inner ear, which is called the oval window. So there's a space here, a wall between the middle and the inner ear. So we're constantly passing vibrations on from one space to the next. Now there's another structure here, the eustachian tube, that's in your inner ear, but that actually doesn't have to do with hearing. So if it were me, I would like star or put a highlight this or something. Um, it's regularly used as an incorrect answer in multiple choice and numeric response questions because it actually really isn't part of the pathway for hearing. This tube connects your middle ear to your throat and also your nose by proxy. It helps to balance air pressure when the pressure inside the ear is different than the pressure outside the ear, like when you go up on a plane. Now your ear and nose and throat are connected to each other because of this little tube. You probably remember from Bio 20 that your nose and throat are connected to each other for breathing purposes, but your ear is connected as well. You might also have heard of doctors called ENTs, ear, nose, and throat doctors, uh, who focus on that portion uh, of anatomy. I had to see an ear, nose, and throat doctor. I had to get my tonsils taken out as an adult. I don't know if any of you have had your tonsils taken out. Is there anyone who had me when you were little? It's not a super common thing anymore. In my generation, it really was. Then they got away from it. But I had to get them taken out because I was getting strep throat like every six weeks. It was ridiculous. Penicillin straight up didn't even work on me anymore. Getting your tonsils out as a kid, I remember my brother did it. He got his tonsils out, stayed home and ate jello for a couple days, and then everything was fine. As an adult though, things are bigger, they hurt more, I guess. It felt like someone burnt the inside of my throat with a blowtorch. I couldn't even swallow my pain pills. I thought I was gonna die. I couldn't talk for like three weeks. Uh, when they told me, uh, okay, you should probably have like X number of days off of work, I was like, what? For tonsils? And I kind of laughed and I was like, okay, I'll book all those days off and it'll be like a vacation. But I got to the end of the two weeks and I had to call Mrs. O and be like, I can't even talk. Uh, there's no way I can teach a class like this. So, ear, nose, and throat doctors. Hmm. 
Now, if you have questions about eardrums or ossicles or eustachian tubes, would you please ask? So, followed by the middle ear, we have the inner ear. Now, we'll go into a bit more detail on the inner ear on the following slides. The inner ear has a few structures. First, the cochlea. It's the thing that looks like a little snail shell. It is the structure that is involved with hearing. It is attached to the auditory nerve, and you can see this big, chunky yellow thing coming out. Attached to that, you have these three loopy tubes called the semicircular canals. They are the structure whose main job is balance. They are attached to a different nerve called the vestibular nerve. Now there's a third nerve in this picture that I'm not gonna talk about, the facial nerve. We're gonna focus on just the auditory nerve for hearing and the vestibular nerve for balance. Now before we go any further, okay. so if we think about the cochlea, so that was the thing that looks like a snail shell in our ear, one of the things that's important to recognize about it, like we mentioned uh, in the video, is that this is the part of the ear that's used for hearing. Specifically, mechanical energy, this energy of movement, is transformed into electrochemical impulses. That's what happens here. Now the inner ear is filled with fluid, like you said. So the consistency of the fluid is like a bit thicker than water, right? It's not uh, quite the same. But as the oval window, which is the membrane between the middle and inner ear vibrates, those vibrations have to be transformed into pressure waves in the fluid. Now we did talk in the video a bit about the difference between um, frequency and amplitude, and we're not going to go too far into detail about how sound works. That's uh, more of a physics thing than here. But very briefly, I wanted to show you this picture because I find that it helps people understand. If I look at the cochlea from like the beginning all the way to the middle part as we follow the curve of the snail shell around, you'll see on this picture that it's got different values for HZ. That's a hertz. That's what we measure frequency with. And so if you have done a bit of physics, you might have worked with waves and frequency and stuff like that. Does that sound familiar to physics people? Yeah. Now we're not going to calculate anything, but I like to show this picture so that you can see that different parts of the cochlea respond to different frequencies of sound. That's one of the ways that you can tell whether something is high or low pitched. Which part of the cochlea is responding will determine which part of your brain gets the message which will determine what you hear in terms of sound. So you don't have to memorize these values, um, but know that 20,000 is really high pitched, it's really fast, really frequent. And down here, 200, that's really low frequency, low pitch. And that's about the range of human hearing. Other species have different ranges for their hearing, but this is ours. So you might know that uh, they make these special dog whistles where it doesn't sound like anything to us, but dogs can perceive higher pitches of sound, higher frequencies, and so they could hear it. And so the reason it's all working is because of which part of the cochlea is going to respond to the sound. Now if we zoom in, this picture over here is what he showed on the video. It's if I took one piece of the snail shell and sliced through it. What would I see? One, two, three cavities, three sections inside of each piece of that tube. Now, you don't have to know the names of each of those cavities. Uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, yeah, never mind. But we're gonna focus on the middle one. The middle one, if we zoom in even farther, has this little structure inside of it. And this little structure is the organ of corti. So it's visible if we take a section of the cochlea. So remember I said, this is just one piece of that snail tube, I've sliced through it and I'm zooming in on the middle. This is the organ used for hearing specifically. Now. 
It is made up of several structures. On the bottom is the basilar membrane. So basilar bottom. The other membrane, tectorial, is on the top. See, basilar bottom, tectorial top, very convenient. But this basilar membrane, the bottom part of it, has hair cells. Now I know you're imagining this hair that's growing on your head, but that's not what it is. But they look like little hairs. So if you see right here, this kind of orangey yellow structure, it's got little things sticking out. That's the hair cells. Those are the mechanoreceptors that are in the organ of Cordy. So these hair cells are attached to this membrane at the bottom. Now what's sticking out of them, it's not really hair, they're little villi. And maybe you remember those words from learning about your intestines in Bio 20. You have villi and microvilli that line your intestines to increase surface area. Anyways, these little villi are called stereocilia. They extend from those uh, auditory cells and they are anchored to this top piece, which is the tectorial membrane. So tectorial membrane on the top, basilar, or basilar membrane on the bottom. Now, why do we care about this? Well, here's what happens. When the stapes, the last of the three ossicles, hits the oval window, it vibrates. And that vibration causes the fluid inside the inner ear to move. So a thing that's key to remember is that even though it looks empty on this picture, remember the cochlea is full of fluid. It's not just air, it's not a vacuum. And so when that little ossicle hits the oval window, it causes the fluid to vibrate and move. This causes the basilar membrane to move up and down, right, in response to the waves of fluid. So imagine that you are in an ocean, or maybe a wave pool if sharks freak you out, uh, and waves are coming. And as the wave comes, you go up and down, up and down. Same thing is happening in the ear. As the fluid moves in waves because of the sound, that basilar membrane goes up and down, up and down. If the sound is higher pitched, uh, it goes up and down more frequently. If the sound is lower pitched, it goes up and down more slowly. Now, when the basilar membrane moves up and down, these little stereocilia have to bend. Why? They're attached to the tectorial membrane on the top. And so it can't just freely move. Those hair cells have to bend in response because they're physically anchored or attached on the top. That flexing, that physical motion, that is what causes depolarization. So unlike a chemoreceptor, where something binding to a receptor opens ion channels, in these mechanoreceptors, physical movement of that little stereocilia is the thing that opens sodium channels. That is what opens the gates and causes depolarization. Yep. Now, these auditory cells are going to send the message through the auditory nerve to the brain. Now, if you have questions you would like to ask about the organ of corti or the cochlea, would you please let me know? So remember, it's all coming back to what's going to cause an action potential. We need to depolarize the membrane which means sodium needs to rush in. That causes the action potential to be generated, and that is what's going to be sent through the auditory nerve, which is really just a bunch of neurons, towards the brain. So, if we think about the next step, now that your ear has processed vibrations and movement of fluid, how do you perceive sound? Well, you have these sensory neurons in your ear. That's what the hair cells are attached to. So the hair cell is your mechanoreceptor. It's attached to the sensory neuron in the ear. Those neurons together form the auditory nerve. A nerve is just a collection of neurons all together. That information travels to the brain stem. The brain stem is where you find the medulla, the pons, uh, the cerebellum, although it doesn't play as big of a role here. Then to the thalamus, hmm, interesting, that was the same place visual information went, because the thalamus 
is a great relay station, especially for sensory information. And then eventually to the temporal lobe of the brain. And so even though brain was our last chapter, I hope you notice we're still talking about action potentials and parts of the brain here. Now there are several things that your brain can perceive. I've already mentioned frequency or pitch. So is it high or low? That's frequency. Amplitude is loudness. And so amplitude is measured, like he said on the video, um, from the bottom to the top of the sound wave. I'm not gonna ask you to calculate any of that. I just want you to be aware that your brain can perceive all of these things. Your brain can also perceive the direction of origin. However, it can be tricked. Just like your eyes can be tricked with optical illusions, your brain can be tricked in terms of direction of origin of sound. Here's why. Sound is based on movement of particles. And so if there's not a direct line between your ear and the source of the sound, it might actually be bouncing off of other things. I'll give you an example. I live in a place where I can hear comp football games if I'm outside in my yard. But when I'm sitting in my yard, it sounds like the comp games are being played in the Costco parking lot to me in terms of where the sound seems like it's coming from. But it's because my house is in the way. My house faces the other way. And so when I sit in my yard and I can hear the announcer guy at the comp uh, yelling stuff about football, the sound has to go over my house and bounce off of something else and then bounce back into my ear. So it can't travel through walls. And so you can perceive the direction of origin to a point, but you, your brain can be tricked. It can be tricked so easily because sound will bounce off of things. Uh, you've probably observed uh, other phenomenon with this. If you've ever heard the sound of a siren getting louder and then quieter as it moves closer and farther away from you, that's another thing that your brain can perceive in terms of sound. Now, just as a matter of interest, if we were to look at the primary place that auditory information is processed in your temporal lobe, there's a little map on it, just like there's a map on your motor cortex, just like there's a map on your sensory cortex, where each part of your brain is associated with a part of your body for motor and sensory information. Well, each part of that section of your temporal lobe is associated with a different portion of the cochlea. Different parts of the cochlea activate different parts of the brain, so you perceive different pitches of sound. Now, the last thing I want to mention about hearing uh, really is not a list of auditory disorders, but rather two categories in which we could put auditory disorders. If a person has issues with hearing, it can fall into one of these two. On the left, we have sensory neural hearing loss. And if you look at the name, sensory neural, we're talking about sensory receptors or neurons, something to do with the pathway that information is following. So this could involve nerve damage. It could involve hair cell damage, because those are the sensory receptors. And it can be due, especially in the case of hair cell damage, to loud noise. Loud noise puts pressure on that fluid in the ear that can eventually destroy stereocilia. So if I were to show you, the top here is what normal stereocilia look like, and the bottom is uh, an ear cell with some permanent damage to those little hair cells. There are other ways that sensory neural hearing loss could occur. Um, one example is what happened to my dad. It turns out he had a virus that attacked his auditory nerve just on his right side. At first he thought his ear was just blocked, like with wax or something, but by the time they figured out what had happened, it was too late and they couldn't repair the nerve. Uh, but it's difficult to treat because we're dealing with sensory receptors and nerve damage. Those things are not easy to fix. On the other side, we have conductive hearing loss. This one often deals with structures that are on the outer or middle ear, rather than the inner ear. This is when there's damage to the conduction system in the ear, so not the sensory receptors or the nerves that are carrying information to the brain, but the structures that are responsible for capturing or amplifying or channeling the vibrations. So this could involve, for example, damage to the eardrum. 
damage to the ossicles, something like that, where they're not vibrating the way that they should. In the case of a conductive hearing loss, hearing aids might help. They don't always, but this is an example where they could, because the issue here is usually that sounds are not being amplified enough, and if we help them become more amplified, then a person could perceive them, uh, because they don't necessarily have damage to their sensory receptors or their neurons. Now, 